the first view is that you believe that the body, this body, is yourself. Thinking, you simply believe that you are this body. So if you believe like that, it means that uh, uh, with this disintegration of this body, you are no longer there. And you believe that before the formation of this body, you were not there. So there are many, uh, many effects that come from that kind of uh, wrong view. The second is uh, to believe in uh, pairs of opposites. And you believe that the right is uh, totally uh, uh, other than the left. There is a birth, there is a death. There is inside, there is outside. There is a being, there is non-being. There is uh, um, sameness, there is uh, otherness. All these concepts that form uh, pairs of opposite, if you are caught in it, that is wrong views. The teaching of Buddha help us to transcend uh, pairs of opposites in order for us to come to a, a view free from all view, that is the middle way. The middle way is the way transcending all pairs of opposite, including being and non-being, birth and death inside and outside, object and subject. This is very, very deep, very, very wonderful teaching. This is called a thang kien. Thang kien, body as a self. And being kien, believing in extreme. And then the next is a kien to kien. Attachment to views. You learn something. You have a notion. You are caught by that notion. And that is the end of your progress on the spiritual path. So whatever you have learned, whatever you have heard, you should be careful. You should not consider it to be the absolute truth. You should be able to let it go in order for you to be able to come to a higher truth. It's like in science, if you have discovered something, and if uh, you believe uh, that to be the ultimate truth, then, then you don't search anymore. You are not a true scientist. So in order to progress in our path, we have to be ready to release our view, release our understanding. It's like uh, climbing on a ladder. If you have come up to the fourth step, and if you think that you are the highest, and then there's no more climbing. You have to abandon to release the fourth in order to get to the fifth. And when you have got to the fifth, you should be ready to, 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 to release the fifth in order to come to the sixth. So knowledge as ob obstacle for knowledge. So if you see something, you understand something, uh, be sure that that's something you can release in the future in order to get to a higher kind of truth. That is uh, the teaching on non-attachment to views. So I think that's uh, very uh, scientific. <clears throat> Tà kiến, 
perverted view. Perver perverted view. <coughs> Suppose you believe that uh, things just uh, happened uh, by chance. There is no cause and effect. That is a kind of uh, perverted view, wrong views. The, the law is that when you sow uh, the beans, the seed of the beans, you will, uh, you will uh, harvest the beans. When you sow the seed of anger, you ha- harvest anger. But you don't believe in, in, the, in the law of cause and effect. You think that everything is uh, just by chance. Or uh, when uh, you observe uh, one thing, uh, deeply you see that uh, that thing manifests because of uh, many conditions coming together. But you believe that you don't need many things coming together, you need only one cause. Uh, That is the kind of view that is uh, perverted. You don't believe in the uh, Four Noble Truth that uh, suffering has come from a way of living that is full of wrong perceptions and um, wrong thinking, wrong speech, wrong action. You believe that suffering just come like that without any cause. So that is uh, a wrong view. And then the last one is Yei Kam Thu. Yei Kam Thu Kiang. That is attachment to, uh, to taboos. You believe that performing such a ritual, uh, you can get liberation, uh, salvation. You are caught by the rituals. You believe that you can eat every kind of meat except beef. Because eating beef will, uh, uh, will prevent you from uh, being saved. Uh, you believe that you can eat every kind of meat except pork. So that is the kind of uh, taboo, that kind of uh, precept, that kind of rituals that you can get caught in it. The fact is that uh, with uh, understanding you can liberate. It's not by performing rituals and things and and absorb, observing taboos that you can get liberation. So these are ten kind of factors that uh, we should uh, be liberated from in order for us to be to be free and happy. So Yetamku took thing is to believe in taboos and in uh, in uh, rituals. Both of you, Buddha, and you are empty in nature. So that is a kind of looking deeply, and that has uh, the power of liberating. And if uh, we don't do that, we believe that buying to the Buddha is, uh, is, um, is an act of devotion that will help you to uh, to be saved, the case uh, where you are caught in rituals. It's like uh, in the in the performance of uh, the Eucharist, and the priest break the bread <coughs> and give it to you, and give the wine for you to uh, to drink. And if you believe that that is uh, really the blood of Jesus and the flesh of Jesus, you are caught by by rituals. In fact, um, in, uh, in Plum Village, every time we hold a piece of bread, we have to look deeply and 
we see that uh, the piece of bread is the body of the whole cosmos. Because in the piece of bread, you see the sunshine, the cloud, the earth, everything. The whole cosmos is in the bread. So when you eat the bread, you are in really touch, in real touch with the cosmos. And that is a practice of mindfulness and insight that will liberate you. So when the priest perform the Eucharist, they want you to be alive. They want you to be in touch with Jesus Christ that is a reality in you. And also the priest, when he performs the ritual, he should perform in such a way that the whole congregation become alive in the here and the now. It's like when we invite the bell. Everyone come home to the here and the now and become alive. And if uh, we don't become alive, we just, um, we just keep silent like a ritual. We are caught. We do the same thing, but, uh, but uh, in different ways. So the Eucharist also like that. When a priest celebrates the Eucharist, he, sh- he should be, become alive. And the congregation in the church should become alive with him. And that is the, the aim of the rituals. It's not uh, because he, it's not possible that he can automatically do the rituals. And that is to be caught in the rituals because we don't get anything except the rituals. But um, uh, communion is something possible when you are truly alive, truly alive, and you feel that you are uh, in Christ, and Christ is in you, and that is what you want, and not, not just the performance of rituals. So the same thing is true in every tradition. We are easily caught in the rituals, and that is one of the factors we have to, to break through. So when we organize a day of mindfulness for people to come, we have to organize in such a way that every moment of the day of mindfulness should be a, day, a moment of uh, mindfulness, a moment of joy, of peace, of uh, freedom. Uh, otherwise, even the day is full with uh, sitting, uh, walking, chanting, but it's empty of life, it's empty of joy and peace, so you are caught in the rituals. Sitting meditation can be a ritual. Walking meditation can be a ritual, chanting can be a ritual, and, and that is one factor. And the Sutra of Mindful Breathing, the 13th, from the 13th on, we come to the area of perception. And the 13th uh, exercise of mindful breathing uh, is uh, the contemplation of uh, impermanence. Contemplating impermanence, I breathe in. The many teachers uh, teach uh, impermanence, including Confucius. And uh, we agree with each other as things are impermanent. Everything is changing. But uh, that does not help very much if you agree with uh, the reality of impermanence. But impermanence here should be used as an instrument and not just an idea. uh, Impermanence here should be used as a samadhi. It means a concentration. All day long, when you get in touch with everything, you are capable of seeing the impermanence of all these things. Your partner, for instance, every time you look at her, you see that she is impermanent. 
and you see yourself also as impermanent. Because we have the tendency to believe in permanence. When you look at the family album, we see ourselves as a five-year-old boy or five-year-old girl. And if you compare that image of the five-year-old child with us now, we see that there is a big difference. We are very different as far as the body is concerned very different as far as the feelings and perceptions are concerned. They are so different. So you can see the big difference between the five-year-old child and us. We see uh, impermanence. And yet, we suddenly believe that we are the same person always. We s- we silently believe that we are always the same person. So our idea of impermanence does not help. Only a deep concentration on the nature of impermanence can help. And permanence, impermanence is not a negative uh, uh, a negative uh, a note uh, in the music because uh, because if uh, you realize uh, that everything is impermanent, you will treasure more uh, what is there. So if you know that your beloved one is impermanent, you will cherish air every moment you can spend with him or her. And when you see the impermanence of things, you see these things are more beautiful, like a shooting star. A shooting star just exists in one second. That is why it's so beautiful. The fireworks, very beautiful because they don't last. So when you get angry at your beloved one, and you intend to say something to punish him or her because she has dared to make you suffer. And then you have to contemplate impermanence. Close your eyes and visualize your beloved one 300 years from now. You will not be there in this form and she will not be there in in that form either. When you touch the nature of impermanence in the person of your beloved one, when you are able to touch the nature of impermanence in yourself, and that can be done in a few seconds, you open your eyes and your anger is gone and you cherish this moment where she is still alive and you are still alive. So you you may like to hold that person in your arms and say, "Ah, you are still alive, I am still here. So anger can be removed just by uh, contemplation of impermanence. And if you have not seen uh, the nature of interbeing, if you have not seen the nature of no self, of dependent origination, you have not seen impermanence. And that is why contemplating impermanence means contemplating the nature of interbeing, of no self, of dependent origination. And impermanence is uh, an instrument not more than that, not the absolute truth that you have to proclaim. Over all other kind of truth. You have to overcome the notion of impermanence. Because the impermanence is not a notion, that is only an instrument.
Suppose we ask the question, what is impermanent? Dear Buddha, you taught us, you, you teach us that everything is impermanent. Please tell us, what is impermanent? The tree is impermanent, the cloud is impermanent, or what? What is impermanent? Impermanent is an adjective. And there should be a noun uh, going to add of that adjective, because an adjective uh, qualified uh, a noun. Impermanence means that uh, nothing can remain the same thing. in two consecutive moments, right? It means that something can only exist in one uh, one instant. And in the next moment, something is there. Something else is there. Not exactly the same thing. So the notion of impermanence is impossible. Because there must be something that is lasting in order for it to be (coughs) impermanent. But you don't see something like that. So semantically, it is observed to see, to say that everything is impermanent. In fact, everything is only for one short moment, a millisecond only. And that is it. If that does not last, how can we say that it's impermanent? So the idea of impermanence should be transcended. We imagine that impermanence is the the appearance, the outside appearance of something, and, and inside there is something that is lasting, and that's something where the mark of uh, impermanence. But in fact, impermanence means that you cannot remain the same person in two consecutive uh, moments. So to say that everything is impermanent does not sound, does not, is not correct. Có người nào không hiểu không? Too complicated, no? (laughs) Before the Buddha is passing away, he uttered a very beautiful uh, gata. This is uh, seen in the Parinirvana Maha Parinirvana Sutta. Every formations, every formation is impermanent. All formations are impermanent. Thì sinh diệt pháp. They are the things that have to go through birth and death. All formations, uh, sarva, samskara, anitya, every formation is impermanent because they are all phenomena that have to go through birth and death. And come the third line, Shin Yek Yek Ye. Tit Yek Vilak.
But when both birth and death dies, and then nirvana becomes the source of happiness. Shen yek yek yi, tet yek vila. But when the notion of birth and death are removed, and then that kind of extinction is called happiness. I, I think many people have mistranslated this gata, especially in the uh, southern tradition. We can divide uh, the gata into two parts. And this is this deal with uh, the the first two lines deal with the historical dimension, and this uh, the second uh, two line deal with the ultimate dimension. And uh, the first two lines are presenting us uh, the relative truth with notions and all kind of phenomena. All kinds of formations are impermanent because all of them have to go through birth and death, birth and death, birth and death. But when you go to the sick Second and uh, second part of the gata, you see, is different. But when the notion of birth and death are removed, when birth and death, both of them die, because birth and death are notions and not reality. Because when you practice looking deeply, you see that in the appearance there is birth and death, but deeply there is no birth and death. Let us go back to the cloud in the sky. A cloud can never die. A a cloud can never uh, pass from being to non-being. A cloud can become uh, snow or ice or rain, but they a cloud can, cannot become nothing. So it is impossible for a cloud to die. But it is also impossible for a cloud to be born. Because be, to be born means from nothing, you become something. From no one, you become someone. A cloud is not like that. Before manifesting herself as a cloud, she had been something else like the water in the ocean, the heat generated by the sun, the water vapor. So she has not come from nothing. So her nature is no birth and no death. So in the beginning, we see that everything is impermanent. They have to go through birth and death. But in the second part, birth and death is our notions. And if uh, you can overcome the notion of birth and death, that extinction of notions make you happy because you are no longer afraid either of impermanence, of birth and of death. This is one of the most beautiful gathas in the literature of Buddhism. We begin with the notion of impermanence. We begin with the notion of birth and death. But finally, we transcend the notion of impermanence. We transcend the, the notion of birth and death. And no fear becomes possible. And that is why uh, impermanence, looking deeply, 
It means uh, interdependence. It means uh, interbeing. It means uh, no self as instruments for meditation. And you should not caught by them. You should not promote them as the absolute truth. The 14th is about uh, the contemplation on uh, no, no craving. The Sanskrit word is viraga. When you have seen that everything is impermanent, they are interbeing, their nature, the, the true nature is interbeing, uh, co arising. And then the, they stop to be the object of your craving. Because um, we have the tendency to, uh, to seek for pleasure. In us, there is, uh, there is uh, a tendency called uh, mano, manas, that always seek uh, to avoid uh, pain and suffering. That's a natural tendency. There's a natural tendency to avoid suffering, to run away from suffering, and to seek pleasure, to run, run after pleasure. That is a natural in us. And uh, that is manas, e, e kang. And without the uh, insight brought about by the practice of meditation, we continue to behave like that, always trying to run away from suffering from pain, always trying to run after pleasure. <coughs> but we know that suffering is important. Suffering can instruct us. If you are not capable to hold your suffering <coughs> and look into the nature of suffering, you can never see the path leading to transformation and healing. And manas, ignore the goodness of suffering. <coughs> Manas always ignore the goodness of suffering. Manas don't see the play of the mud in the lotus pond. As he believed that lotus is possible without the mud. <coughs> and Manas ignore the danger of running after objects of craving. She's ready to die if uh, she's, uh, she can get it. She's so attracted to the object of her craving that she accepts to die after having got it. But uh, she does not know that uh, the object of craving can bring her a lot of suffering. She does not know that uh, the object of craving is like uh, a piece of bare bone. It will never satisfy us, satisfy the, the dog. And that is why to meditate means to uh, to get an insight about um, the goodness of suffering, the danger of uh, of um, of running after uh, object of our craving, and to help manas 
to transmit that insight to manas. <laughs>